Good morning, everyone. My name is Noelle O'Connell, and I'm the Executive Director of European Movement Ireland. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you in attendance this morning for European Movement Ireland's In Conversation webinar series with our special guest of honour this morning, European Ombudsman Emily O'Reilly. Emily will be joined in conversation by author Martina Fitzgerald for what promises to be a compelling discussion on the Office of the European Ombudsman, and I'm very much looking forward to this morning's conversation. Today, however, is a day of mixed emotions. Uh, we awoke this morning to the very sad news of the tragic passing of Detective Garda Colm Horgan, who tragically lost his life in the line of duty last night. On behalf of all of us, our deepest condolences um, to his family, his friends, colleagues, and our thoughts are with them and members of the force uh, today. In addition, if I may, today I would also like to remember someone who is at the center of everything that European Movement Ireland represents, because today also marks the 48th anniversary of the untimely death of Michael Sweetman a man who was unwaveringly committed to the European project and tirelessly dedicated to the furtherance of a European Ireland. Michael Sweetman was one of the 118 people who so tragically lost their lives in the Staines air disaster on the 18th of June, 1972. A devoted and a committed European, Michael Sweetman served as executive director of the Irish Council of the European Movement today, European Movement Ireland. And his legacy, his legacy of communications, collaboration and engagement, it is a legacy that we in European Movement Ireland continue to be inspired by and guided by in all that we do. And it is imperative that we recognize and crucially continue the work to which Michael Sweetman dedicated his life. Established in 1954 by way of background, European Movement Ireland is Ireland's longest established not-for-profit voluntary membership organisation dedicated exclusively to promoting and engaging on European issues here in Ireland. We do that by endeavouring to strengthen the connection between all sectors of Irish society and the European Union, and we aim to engage and inform the public on all aspects of the EU, of Europe, including the institutional bodies to elections, policy decisions, and everything in between. And ultimately our goal and our objective is to increase both awareness, understanding, and indeed engagement on European issues here in Ireland, and to act as that bridge between Ireland and Europe through communications, outreach, publications, programs, events, and I think it's fair to say since the uh, 12th of March, increasingly through the form of webinars. And today's webinar is one of a series of multiple webinars that EM Ireland has recently hosted. From our annual Ireland and the EU uh, poll, uh, Red Sea poll, um, where we had guests, Dr. Katie Hayward from Queen's University Belfast and RTE's Europe editor, Tony Connolly, to interviews with Ireland's member of the European Court of Auditors, Tony Murphy, Vice President of the European Investment Bank, Andrew McDowell, and Andrea Schwartz from the European Commission's uh, DG for Budget. And to last week, we had Deputy Director General of the Legal Service of the European Commission, Karen Banks. The catalogue of our online webinars is increasingly comprehensive, equally increasingly, I hope, informative. They have become a central part of EM Ireland's ongoing efforts to reach out to our audience and to connect with you all, despite the current challenges. And I would like to encourage you all in attendance to, if you're not already, follow us on all our social media channels in order to be kept up to date on our activities, our events, our projects, our programs, and to access our content from our webinars to our policy briefings and much more. And like many organizations in Ireland and across Europe, this is a challenging time for, for all organizations and for us here in EM Ireland, as we continue to work in, in dif different circumstances on strengthening and developing that connection between Ireland, the EU and Europe. Your support to our work is more important than ever. We are a membership-based organization going back from Michael's time when he was its executive director. 
And membership and support and engagement is central to who we are and to what we do. As an individual or an organization, if you're not already, we would really encourage you to join and become a member of European Movement Ireland today and enjoy the wide range of benefits and services associated with that membership. You'll have access to our briefings, our insights, our event invitations before anyone else, and also access to our network of thinkers, policymakers, influencers, while also supporting our work and the development of Ireland's EU relationship over what is likely to be an uncertain and certainly challenging time ahead. We have a wide range of memberships available from organizations, individuals, students, interns, institutions and bodies. And we would greatly appreciate if you could take a look at the membership section on our website for more information or drop us an email at info at europeanmovement.ie if you want to discuss um, any further plans or membership services that might be of interest to you. We'd be delighted to talk further with you because it is through your support that enables us to continue the important work that we have done for over 65 years and are determined to keep on doing. And if I may, in terms of Ireland's place in Europe, it's important also to not forget about Ireland's place in the world and globally. And on behalf of all of us and in European Movement Ireland and myself, I would like to extend our sincerest congratulations to, to Team Ireland on last night's, uh, or was it yesterday evening's success at securing a seat uh, at the United Nations Security Council. I know a huge green jersey effort on the campaign to secure this result took place, and I would like to congratulate and pay tribute to all those involved, in particular, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and its Irish mission to the UN, ably led by Ambassador Geraldine Bernason. So, uh, credit and, and chapeau to them on the fantastic achievement. Before I hand over to Martina Fitzgerald to formally introduce our guest of honour, European Ombudsman Emily O'Reilly, I might briefly outline the, the Office of the European Ombudsman. It's an independent and impartial body responsible for investigating administrative complaints related to the European institutions and European bodies by assisting people, enterprises, and organizations in assessing and evaluating complaints and ensuring that European institutions are held accountable for maladministration, such as unfair conduct, abuse of power, discrimination, lack of information, incorrect procedures, and administrative delays. The European Ombudsman has a crucial role in promoting an accountable, transparent, and ethical administrative European system. And the Ombudsman is involved in different areas of EU administration, from transparency, accountability, and ethics, to fundamental rights, administrative procedures, practices, and personnel issues, with the core of their work being transparency, to ensure that our European Union is a fair and open union. So with that brief introduction of the Office of the Ombudsman out of the way, Briefly to go through the running order for this morning's webinar, Emily will deliver a keynote address after being formally introduced by Martina. Following that, uh, Martina will join Emily in conversation and, uh, and have, have, have a chat and a discussion. And lastly then, I will join in with some questions from you, our online audience. Uh, so we will um, be encouraging you, as you can see on the banner there, please, to send in your questions as outlined below. Equally to those of you following us on YouTube and Twitter, please send in your questions using the hashtag EMI Engage. And I'd like to thank you all very much for being with us this morning uh, for what promises to be an informative and compelling webinar. And with that, I'm delighted to hand over to Martina Fitzgerald to formally introduce our European Ombudsman, Emily O'Reilly. Martina, over to you. Thanks, Noelle, and I'm delighted to be here this morning. Uh, our guest speaker, Emily O'Reilly, has had a distinguished career as a journalist, as an author, and as an ombudsman at national and EU level. She was first elected by the European Parliament as EU ombudsman in 2013, re-elected in 2014, and again last year, uh, beating off four serious contenders from across the EU. And I think it's fair to say it was a hard fought contest and one not for the faint hearted, not quite Game of Thrones territory, but not far off. Her re-election though is viewed as an endorsement of her record. And also I think an endorsement of her broad vision for the role. And Emily, of course, 
uh, also holds the distinction of being Ireland's first uh, Ombudsman and Information Commissioner. She also served as Commissioner for Environmental Information. And before that, of course, she was an award-winning political journalist and author of three books. And she currently serves on the advisory board of Harvard's Neiman Foundation for Journalism. So I'm delighted that we have her here this morning to discuss the work and the challenges facing her office against the backdrop of COVID-19. So without further ado, it's over to you, Emily, and congratulations again on that re-election. I'm sure you could do a full uh, session on campaigning at some <laughs> further stage for any uh, politician across Europe, but over to you. Thank you very much, Martina. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction and, and good morning, Noel. Go, good morning, everybody. Could I just uh, begin by also sending my condolences to the family of Detective Garda? Uh, Horkin, who so sadly died last night. Uh, it was shocking news indeed to wake up to this morning and we send our condolences to the family and indeed to the force uh, who will feel this uh, very, very acutely. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to begin by, uh, by outlining a little bit more about what, what the European Ombudsman uh, is. It was, it was created uh, out of the Maastricht Treaty in 1993. It, it set up shop uh, in, in, in 1995. Um, and the idea was that just as every European citizen in virtually all of the European states have access to an ombudsman who can deal with their complaints against the administration. It was thought that there should be an ombudsman who can deal with complaints against the European uh, administration. So the office was created. And as Martina said, you get there by being elected by the parliament. And like the commissioners and judges and auditors and so on, you're not put forward by your government. You go forward on your own uh, personal and professional experience. Uh, and so it was that I was elected in 2013, again in 2014, and then a rather a tough election in uh, 20, uh, 2019 in, in December. Um, so uh, as Noelle and Mar Martina have, have described the work, I mean, I suppose the big difference between being an ombudsman in a member state and being an ombudsman at, at European level at the institutions is, that, is the nature of the complaints that you get. I mean, most people's complaints against the administration have to do with their own national administration, maybe health complaints, social welfare complaints, housing, um, all of that. And all of those, generally speaking, are member state competences. So therefore, the, the type of complaints that we get at EU level is, is sort of qualitatively different. So most of the complaints we get would be against the commission. It's not that the commission is the poor administrator and quite the opposite uh, normally um, but rather that that it is the big beast in the jungle it is the the executive body of the eu so you would expect that um, we also get complaints about the regulatory agencies for example the european medicines agencies we also get complaints in relation to the european central bank the european investment bank all of the bodies and agencies but the the commission would, would be our big client uh, so to speak so the type of complaints we get transparency is a huge piece because obviously the, the EU is out there and not, not everybody understands how it works. It's complex. It can be opaque sometimes. So we get a lot of uh, queries and complaints, access to documents requests from, from citizens, yes, but also from civil society, from NGOs, from business, for example. Uh, we've had uh, complaints from, from, from Ryanair in the past, uh, for example. And, some of the big global companies who, who want to get uh, information that they haven't been able to uh, easily access uh, uh, through the institutional route. Um, the, uh, we also get obviously complaints in relation to contracts, grants and so on. And given the huge, the hundreds of billions of euro that the EU is about to uh, pump into all of our economies over the next uh, few years. I imagine that we will get an increased number of complaints uh, to see, you know, who's getting the money, how it's been spent, has been spent appropriately, and so on. Uh, so you could get a complaint even from, you know, a little company, a small NGO in, in, in Ireland, who may have got a grant. There may have been some issues with how it was spent. Uh, the commission is looking for its money back or something like that. They come to us uh, and we look into it and make a recommendation. The transparency of decision making is 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 a huge piece. Um, we did a big investigation a few years ago in the transparency of the council, that is all of our ministers, ministers for agriculture, finance, all of the different sectoral uh, ministers who come over and make the laws that impact on us. Uh, and at council level, the decision making can be rather, rather opaque. So we've tried to um, uh, encourage them to open that up because obviously we can only um, uh, engage our our right to involve ourselves in in decision making uh, <clears throat> in the EU if we actually know what's going on in the first place and particularly if we know the positions that our own member state governments are taking in relation to uh, to, to many areas <clears throat> we get a lot of because Brussels is a huge lobbying centre obviously because the regulations that are made at EU level often have, have global impacts you think of the tech companies for example, as a, 
a clear example of that. So a lot of the um, NGOs who monitor the work of the tech companies or, or other big corporations or uh, who monitor the work of lobbyists generally in the EU, they also have set up shop in Brussels. So very often if they can't get the information they need or if they want to know what's happening, um, who, who's lobbying, uh, what, what, what's going on, um, they come to us and they, they may be an access to documents request or it may be an allegation that there is a conflict of interest or that there has been inappropriate lobbying going on at commission level or or whatever and, and we look into that as well. The revolving doors issue is another one. Uh, obviously, um, if, if you're looking to influence EU policy, the best people to get on your team are the people who have been devising or advising on that EU policy. And therefore, we do have a lot of people who would move from the Commission, say, into the private sectors. There's nothing wrong with that, but the, it's important to make sure that the public interest continues to be served uh, rather than the private interest of the particular company that has engaged a former official or indeed a former commissioner. Um, so I think to possibly to, to make all this a little bit more real, I'm just going to go through some of the complaints that we're currently dealing with so that you can get a, an idea of, um, of, of the sort of work we're doing. So uh, a complaint that came to us within the last couple of weeks involves uh, a very big company that many of you will have heard of. That is the BlackRock Investment Management, not BlackRock here, but BlackRock, uh, I think, uh, uh, an international uh, global company. And they won a contract uh, from the European Commission uh, a short time ago to carry out a study, which is basically around the greening or the making sustainable of um, <clears throat> EU banking rules, um, EU banking regulations. <clears throat> so in other words, how can regulations be devised that sort of uh, play to the uh, the creation or the uh, uh, further enlargement of, of, uh, of, of an economy that, that is green, that invests sustainably and so on. So you can see that, that they are important. So that, that was given uh, to uh, BlackRock and um, a number of MEPs uh, complained about that. They allege that there is a conflict of interest between, with, between BlackRock and, and the work of the, the Commission and the EU generally because they say of the various investments and business interests that BlackRock has. So that complaint has come to us. It went first to the Commission. The MEPs involved weren't satisfied with the response they got from the Commission, so it's come back to us. So what can we do? Well, basically, my biggest power is the power to inspect documents. So all of the records that, that um, are, are involved in in uh, the granting of this contract to BlackRock uh, will be visible uh, to me. Um, so that means that I can forensically examine what happened, uh, test it against the rules, the regulations, the principles, the codes, whatever was binding uh, on the commission when it awarded that contract and uh, then make a decision in, in relation to it, either that it was fine or that there may have been maladministration or I may, may make some suggestions for, for future work. Now, the, my recommendations are not binding and that that is typical of, of, of most ombudsmen so therefore the real power that I have is that power of investigation of inspection so that when people read my report they can know that I have seen everything I need to see and, and that that is very important and that that sort of builds up the the trust in in in, in my office and 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 underscores its independence as well uh, so that's one that we're doing at the moment now another one which had a, a kind of an Irish angle to it was um, a complaint we got in relation to uh, the decision by uh, the European Banking Authority to allow its now former executive director to join one of Europe's biggest lobbying companies. Uh, and the complaint was, that, look, this was a clear conflict that somebody who had who had been involved in, in, uh, in, in, in regulation um, should not be going to a, a lobbying firm to that actually make sure that the regulations suit it's 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 clients. Uh, again, there, there's nothing wrong in that, but you know there has to be uh, openness and transparency, and and above all, the public interest has to be guaranteed and all of that. So, uh, we looked into that and we found maladministration um, uh, on the part of the EBA. We said that they should have not have allowed um, Mr. Farkas to move to the uh, lobbying company, even though they had put lots of uh, restrictions uh, on his work. Uh, they did have the power to do that. And uh, the point I made in, in, in my report was that if they didn't do it for that job, then what job were they going to do it for? Uh, so we made recommendations for how they should do this into the future. Now, uh, the Irish angle, I mean, it, it was not directly related to my work, but at 
while the, all this was going on, the obviously the EBA had to find a replacement for uh, Mr. Farkas, and they nominated uh, Jerry Cross, who is who is a director of the Irish Central Bank. So it is the Parliament actually who decides whether or not um, the executive director should be appointed or not. So uh, Mr. Mr. Cross had an excellent track record and undeniably uh, in, in the work that he did went before the Econ Committee, the Economic and Monetary Affairs uh, Committee. Uh, and he was questioned about um, a the fact that as a board member of the EBA, he had endorsed uh, the decision to allow uh, Mr. Mr. Farkas to move to the uh, lobbying association. Uh, but also he himself had worked um, quite a, quite a long time ago, about five years ago, for, for the same lobbying company. So in the end, Econ uh, vetoed his appointment, and then the the parliament in turn uh, took the the advice of, of of econ, and they also vetoed his decision. So you can see that this issue about uh, conflicts of interest at, at that level is 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 very is very very important. And the point I made was that you know the regulators cannot allow themselves to become proxy recruiters for those um, whom whom they regulate. So uh, we, we, we are waiting um, the EBA's comments in relation to that. Um, uh, we're also doing a big piece of work on COVID-19. Uh, we're basically looking at how the um, EU responded uh, to the pandemic. We're not looking at what the member states did, but we're looking at the various agencies that would have had an involvement, for example, the European Centre for Disease Control, um, the European Medicines Agency, and DG Sante, which is the, the health uh, department, if you like, of, of the Commission. And it, this is not with a view to be critical, but as you know, there's been a great deal of talk since this pandemic started about making public health health generally a much bigger EU competence uh, uh, because now it has been closely guarded obviously by the, by the member states. So I'm hoping that this piece of work will enable people to see where the gaps are at European level and, and how best uh, they, they, might be, they might be filled. Um, we also just, I was speaking a little while ago about council transparency and, and of course this is an issue dear to Irish arts as well and this is the fishing quotas which are negotiated really in secret every year um, and then uh, various countries are told how much particular fish they can they can uh, they can catch and and, and so on uh, so we had a complaint um, uh, in relation with well, access to documents requests in relation to um, member state positions in relation to uh, the fishing quotas. In other words, you know, how is this discussed? How is this debated? I mean, if this was being debated in, in a member state, we'd know who the runners and riders were. We'd know the positions of the various parties and so on, but, but not the case, um, but not the case here. So um, the commission uh, refused to uh, release the records because they feel the whole thing is so delicate. If there was too many people joining in the conversation, nothing would happen. But you see, this is this is where you have the balance between people's democratic right to take part and have their voices heard, and the need to get things done. So sometimes the need to get things done um, uh, is 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 too much uh, too much. Uh, weight is given to that. That that sounds counterintuitive, but. When you think about it, when you think about Euroscepticism across Europe and, and, and Europe being, uh, you know, characterized, caricatured as unaccountable, faceless bureaucrats, all, all that sort of stuff. And then when things are done in secret, that gives them ammunition to say that, well, look, we have no idea, you know, how, how these things are arrived at. So that is our argument. Uh, I mean, as an ombudsman, sometimes you can have a... Sometimes you can uh, have something accepted very, very quickly, very, very rapidly. Sometimes you're actually trying to um, uh, do uh, produce a cultural shift uh, in thinking about these things. Um, so um, there was another one also in relation to um, council lack of transparency when it came to the use of pesticides and bees. Um, the regulatory, the agency for the food safety regulatory agency uh, had given advice uh, to the commission uh, in relation to the appropriate use of pesticides and bees got to do with biodiversity and so on. Uh, and um, that advice has been stuck at council level for the last, I think, seven years since 2013. So uh, a, a French uh, NGO um, uh, environmental NGO looked for access to the member states' positions. Basically, they wanted to know, well, if this has been held up, who's holding it up? Uh, and the commission thought long and hard about it, and I've no doubt consulted with the council. And they came back saying, yes, we can see the public interest 
in doing this, but we believe that there's greater public interest in protecting the deliberative process. Now, that would be valid if the deliberative process had been going on for six months, but not valid when things can go and hide uh, for seven years at council level, and there's no pressure put on member states to move because we don't know uh, what's what's going on. But even though that uh, recommendation was was rejected, it got, a, it got a lot of visibility. We got a huge number of emails actually in relation to it. It became a topic again. And I think, again, you know, when you're trying to influence change, you need a coalition of forces and you, sometimes you need quite a bit of time before the cultural shift happens. But I'm confident that even though those two particular cases we we failed in our objective i think overall i think we we may have lost the battle but i think we will win the war uh, in the end um another case that we dealt with uh, recently that uh, again had an irish um angle um an irish involvement an irish interest and that was a, a gentleman who had uh, sought whose son suffers from uh, uh, cystic fibrosis, very young child. And uh, the father had learned that a particular drug, which is authorized in um, uh, in the United States, uh, had not been authorized uh, in the EU yet. Uh, and it, it, this is time critical because if this dr particular drug was to be effective, it had to be given to the child before he reached the age of two. Uh, so this was hugely time critical. And the complaint to us was that um, uh, Emma had delayed in, in authorizing this drug. So we got in, put in touch with, with Emma. We had long back and forth with them. And in fairness to Emma, they had a lot of back and forth uh, with this man. And uh, we scrutinized how they were going about uh, authorizing it and uh, to see whether there were delays or not. But anyway, in the middle of all of this, the uh, drug was authorized by Emma uh, to the great delight of the father. And we hope and pray that, that it will have a positive uh, impact for, for his son. Now, I'm not saying that it was uh, entirely due to our work uh, that, that this happened, but, but it certainly focused uh, Emma on the issue. We didn't find maladministration the part. They have to be very cautious about what they are prescribing or what they are authorizing, particularly drugs uh, for children. But, but uh, in this event, it was authorized appropriately. It may have been a little bit speeded up thanks to our, our involvement. So that, that's just a very brief overview of the work we did. Just on Brexit, um, the work we did there was on the transparency of the talks uh, at EU level, obviously not at UK level. And we uh, wrote to Mr. Barnier and kept in touch with his team right, right through those negotiations to make sure that, that people were kept abreast of what was happening. And I think that was successful. Of course, there was a political imperative, you can see, for the EU to have everything out there and for the UK to keep everything close to its, its chest. But I think everybody was, was uh, able to follow uh, almost line by line the way the negotiations were going. And in fact, I think it was remarked upon at the end that you know member states were very happy to endorse uh, what, what Mr. Barney had had proposed advice at the time because um, uh, they, they knew everything had been transparent, which is my argument that if you make it transparent, then people will trust in it more. Uh, the more information that you have and the more that it is seen to be trustworthy, then I mean that 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 uh, that, that helps to increase trust generally. And I think going forward, obviously, there's huge decision to be made by the European Council uh, if it is made tomorrow in relation to the to the funding. Um, of uh, of the member states in, in the wake of the of the COVID uh, pandemic, even though it isn't over yet, as we know, there's huge amounts of money. I think 500 billion in what are proposed to be grants, and another 250 billion in what are proposed to be loans. Um, now, as you know, there are arguments between different member states in relation to the the, the ratio of loans versus grants and so on. Um, but uh, you know the commission has been quite quite forward and quite uh, um, uh, I suppose ambitious in, in relation to this, and we will see whether the lessons vis-a-vis uh, -vis austerity that that we've all learned uh, since the two thousand and eight crisis will have been learned this time. So um, obviously the the transparency uh, of 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 how that funding is is, uh, is 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 delivered and so on you can imagine all of the sectors lobbying in relation to it uh, so i imagine that that will be a piece of work that um uh, that that we will use going forward i mean i think it is 
as you know, Germany will take up the presidency of the of the EU uh, at the end of this month, presidency of the Council, and uh, the German Chancellor Merkel, uh, she gave a very powerful address uh, in early March, and she stressed the need in a, in a democracy to explain a leader's political decisions uh, and to make them transparent. Uh, and I think countries that have done well in relation to this have done have done precisely that. So I think it's a bit of a pity that the German presidency on its list of things to get done um, uh, during its presidency hasn't mentioned transparency once, as I understand. So there is an opportunity there um, uh, to, to match the, the rhetoric with the actions. So I look forward to that. So look, that's the uh, kind of a brief overview of, of, of what we do. We delve into many different areas, you can see, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks, Emily. And I'm going to go straight into some of the issues that you mentioned there. First of all, COVID-19. I think you wrote uh, to the, the heads of the EU institutions at the beginning of all of this to state that uh, transparency is needed now, not despite of COVID-19, but because of because of it, because of the scale of the decisions being made. Have you any concerns that because there's so much contact by telephone, maybe private Zoom meetings, that not everything is being documented? Or what are your concerns in that area? Well, yes, I do have concerns because, uh, you know, all of us from our own personal experience of this um, pandemic and our own family's experience of it, what, what do we need to know? We need as much information as we, as we can get. We need information sources that we can trust uh, and we need our leaders to be transparent and open with us and I think that's worked well in, in Ireland and it's worked well in in other countries as well but you know the the, the business hasn't stopped from the EU uh, there are vast amounts of money about to be spent um, in in relation to this and you can imagine it's 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 lobbying heaven and it's it's entirely appropriate that 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 would be done but the same rules apply uh, under um, pandemic rules as they did beforehand and that means that all of these meetings have to be documented and minuted and we need to know what's happening because it's not as easy now because obviously um, not as many MEPs are actually physically in Brussels keeping an eye on things it's harder obviously from from your home um, you know the lobbyists are having meetings like this um, which are by nature a little bit more more intimate and private i guess uh but we have said and will continue to say that that the same rules apply and it's 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 very important as transparency is sometimes seen as a as an optional extra decoration on the you know on, on the body of the, of the of the administration but it actually goes completely to the heart of this particular crisis and even in relation to the work that, that we're planning to do um, on that, that we are we're doing at the moment, looking at how the various agencies and institutions responded. I mean, that is with a view to delving down and seeing what actually happened uh, in the run up to it, uh, and 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 immediately afterwards, so so that we can let people know um, what was going on, and also allow you know policymakers to make new laws and regulations on on, on the back of that if they so choose. Now, one of the areas, and you've mentioned it there again, is that you've had to deal with time and time again, is people moving into jobs and out of jobs into the private sector. And you mentioned the European uh, Banking Authority. In the recommendations that you made in relation to that, you suggested and your office suggested that maybe there would be a time period of up to perhaps two years where people don't take certain roles. Now, can I ask you, isn't there a balance there to be found between, you know, preventing conflicts of interest and also people getting a livelihood. Yeah, well, it's it's frequently put in those stark terms, but it's it's never it's never actually quite like that. I mean, there there are plenty of things people can do uh, for for their livelihood, and if you have been in senior positions in 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 the Commission or wherever, you're you're you're, you're pretty marketable. But I remember um, reading a book a few years ago about a, a notorious um, lobbyist, uh, Mr. Abramoff, I think his name was, who was actually jailed in the United States. So to be jailed for lobbying or well, he, he wasn't just lobbying, he was bribing people, um, is, is quite something. But I remember a line in his book that struck out, and he said that the that if there was one single thing that if he had the power, he, he became a, a convert afterwards, obviously, and a, you know, a, a, an anti, an anti uh, inappropriate lobbying campaigner. Um, if there's one thing that, that he would stamp out and that he said would be the revolving door because it was the single biggest uh, uh, weapon in the arsenal of lobbyists because let's think about it let's say you're working in the commission okay and you don't have to be at a high level but you could be at, at a level in which you do a lot of the technical stuff you do a lot of the preparation of the of the proposed regulation or whatever it is so you're getting really 
deep into these things. So therefore, you have a lot of knowledge. And if you're working at that level in the commission, by definition, you're pretty bright anyway. You're supposed to be pretty bright. <laughs> so you are immensely valuable to somebody. You have the keys of the kingdom. You have all that knowledge. You have that network. So, I mean, if you're, um, if you're a company and the EU is thinking of bringing in a regulation that impacts your, 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 your work, you want to influence the making of that regulation. You want it constructed in such a way that it will be do least damage to you, which is, again, entirely reasonable. So if you get somebody with all that inside knowledge about how these regulations are made and how to do it, and maybe if you insert this here or take that out there, then this will have the impact of whatever, then that, that is hugely valuable. But that damages the public interest because then you have regulations being watered down or being devised in a way that suits particular private interests, but not the public interests. And that's why, um, and I think, you know, I, I mean, obviously I, 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 take, I take the argument about, uh, about uh, people wanting to have jobs, but um, I mean, if, if you, I remember talking to, to a commissioner about this and I said, well, look, who was making the same argument. And I said, well, look, you wouldn't let somebody come into your office and rifle through your files and hack into your computer and take everything and walk off with it. I said, well, that's exactly what happens, but not exactly, but you know, you can make an analogy between that and somebody who has all that information in their head and that network who goes to a private company. I mean, why else do they want them? But is two years too long to wait? You know, is, is that a well, too look, long? I mean, look, I mean, I, I, people, people have come to me, well, once we started doing this, 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 you know, there were a couple of high profile pieces of work that, that we did. And so people would kind of ask me informally, well, what about, can I do, you know, 80 months or six months or whatever? There's nothing, you can't be prescriptive about these things. You can't do it by slide rule. Actually, nobody knows what a slide rule is nowadays, so I have to stop using that analogy. But anyway, you, you can't do it. It's not a mathematical equation. I mean, in, in the case of, of, of Mr. Farkas, here you had, had, I mean, the EBA was set up as a response to the, um, to the financial crisis. And it was meant to take a lot of the, the powers or, or maybe control the member state regulators a little bit more. Okay, so this is all about regulation. And then the person who has overseen this for the last number of years immediately goes to uh, a lobbying company whose precise interest is in, uh, you know, uh, devising or developing regulation that suits the members of that lobbying firm rather than the public and particularly the public who suffered so horribly as a result of poor regulation uh, in the run up to the financial crisis. Now, in the run-up to your re-election, er, and the election, so to speak, uh, Politico had a great quote. They said, some viewed you as a steadfast defender of citizens' rights, and others viewed you as a political meddler uh, who had gotten too big for her boots. Now, obviously, the clear majority of the parliament uh, agreed with the first statement, but is it difficult to navigate and make tough decisions? Because your office and you are apolitical, but the decisions have political repercussions and some affecting very high ranking officials. Yeah, well, I, I mean, without sounding pious, there's no point in being in the job if you're not prepared to do the job. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it certainly it was a difficult election. And certainly a lot of those decisions that I had made had rankled with, well, particularly the European People's Party, the centre-right party, and they did not vote for me. And I have to say that all of the Irish MEPs, the Fine Gael MEPs uh, in that grouping did support me. And, and uh, I want to pay particular thanks to Sean Kelly, who's the leader of the delegation, in the European Parliament, the Fine Gael delegation, who really went out of his way to support me, almost to the point where he, you know, probably didn't do himself to, uh, a lot of good within within that grouping. But um, I think, you know, when when the Ombudsman uh, institution was created, I mean, every now and then the EU, you know, devises uh, something, an entity that is supposed to uh, further embed um, the, the the legitimacy of the EU and and the, the the democracy of the or the democratic nature of the EU. And the ombudsman uh, was was one of those creatures, was one of those entities. But of course, sometimes, you know, they think there's there's a feeling that well, okay, we've created it and it looks good, so just sit there in your office and deal with small complaints and don't annoy us. But I mean, the ombudsman under the treaties has a huge mandate. I mean, that is to be the watchdog of the of the of the entire European administration, which is huge. So I, I say, you know, we're we're a small office, but with a big mandate, and it's a mandate that I take extremely seriously and um you know yeah there, there were there were some of the 
some of the big cases that we dealt with. I mean, we dealt with, uh, you know, former Commission President Barroso's decision to join <coughs> Goldman Sachs. Uh, we dealt with the uh, appointment uh, of um, the manner in which the, the former Secretary General of the Commission, Martin Selmayr, uh, was appointed. Um, and and they were, the, yeah, they were, were difficult. But, you know, like my, my feeling is that, um, you know, I, I do get such a sense of, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm of, of, of the lack of, of trust, not even the lack of trust, but, but people's uh, concern about not knowing who to trust or what to trust. And I think if, if this small office at least can put out the facts there in an independent way, and in, in I won't say fearless, that sounds far too heroic, but, you know, just, just to do your job as you're supposed to do it, then, then that helps. And I think what was... What was interesting about um, certainly the the, the Selmar case was that when when we made the report, it was it was actually only us, only this office that could have made that report because we were the only office that could access fully the documents that we needed to put the, the chronology of what happened together. And and I think equally in in relation to this uh, to the COVID report that we're doing equally, even though at the moment we're just working on documents that are in the public record, but when we, we drill down, we will be seeking access to perhaps more confidential mm -hmm. documents. And at the end, we will be able to put something out that people can trust. Um, so the characterization uh, of me was, um, you know, I mean, actually flattering, whichever way you look, actually. <laughs> so I, I, I wasn't... I wasn't too, it's not the worst thing that could be said about one, I suppose, you know, but uh, yeah, but it was a tough campaign and, and it was, I mean, it, it came down to, I mean, the, the person who, who my, my biggest uh, competitor was putting forward a view of the office that, you know, highly legalistic and um, not getting involved in basically anything that would annoy anybody. Uh, and, you know, so Parliament was left with a choice, well, do you want this active uh, ombudsman or do you want somebody that retreats to the shadows um, and, and is just a decoration of the administration so happily uh, what I was doing uh, won out. And I think that raises issues about the power and scope of your office in terms of of the, the, the scope of it. I think Transparency International has made a point that there is a grey area in the fact that to the degree that you can be an advocate for policy uh, and bring it in a certain direction possibly. And also you don't have teeth. You mentioned it there, there are no penalties, there are no sanctions. Would you like to see that change now as the as the office celebrates its 25th anniversary? Um, first of all, I, I don't, I, I tend not to use the word advocate or advocacy in relation to the work. Obviously there can be a, a, an outcome, uh, uh, even a political outcome of the work that I do, but it's not that I'm advocating for, I'm, I mean, what I'm doing is standing between the administration and and the people and saying, look, this is what you should have done. And, and, and then when I make the recommendations, then whatever happens, happens. In relation to powers, no, uh, because I think, um, oddly enough, the, 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 the weaker an ombudsman's powers are, the more it points to um, the, uh, the, 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 the strength of an administration. I mean, uh, or um, whether an administration is a good administration or not. For example, mo most of the, sort of the older ombudsman institutions, let's say typically in, in, in the Nordic countries where, where an ombudsman is created in Denmark, Sweden and so on, um, they, they have weak powers. They have powers of recommendation just as I, we do, but, but uh, uh, virtually all of their recommendations are accepted because it's a good administration. It accepts the appropriate role of the ombudsman within the architecture of the administration. And if the ombudsman's uh, recommendations stop, started being rejected, then that would point to something bad in the administration. So in that sense, it, it acts like a canary in the mine. So in other sort of, shall we say, newer established uh, democracies uh, where the rule of law is a little more fragile, the ombudsman has tended to be given stronger powers because they need it because recommendations alone might not be accepted. So um, I, I think for as long as the ombudsman within the European administration is listened to and, and her recommendations, if they're seen to be sound and valid uh, and based on sound legal and other principles, um, if they are accepted, then I don't think uh, I don't think I need more powers. The only area in which I think I think there is a problem, and that is in relation to transparency or freedom of information. Because as Irish ombudsman, I was also information commissioner under mm. two different two different laws, two different statutes. Ombudsman recommendations, information commissioners binding decisions. So if the Department of Agriculture say didn't like uh, a recommendation that I made to release a particular document, they had to 
unless they wanted to take me to court. <clears throat> so the power balance was with the people accessing the records and, and, and with me. Whereas here, if I if somebody tries to access a record and I make a recommendation that it be accepted, then you know the only way that the people and, and let's say the commission refuses, then people have to go to court themselves. So you know the, the power remains with the institution. They they um, control the tap, uh, whether to turn it on, you know, in uh, or, or whether to be sort of mean about it and let, and let very, very little out. So, I mean, I have kind of over the years sort of floated the idea of, of having a, an information commissioner, but, um, you know, for, for anything like that to happen, you need a big swell of support from Parliament, from civil society and so on. But um, I think the area in which we would get most pushback is in the area of... Um, of access to documents. So something needs to happen there. Okay. In terms of your own agenda, I noticed that your, your office published best practice code in relation to uh, harassment within institutions. Um, and obviously that's a, an issue for many parliaments and many institutions across the board, according to, to polls of members. Um, how important was that for you to, to, to put down a clear code of practice? And secondly, you've also indicated for your next term that you're going to look at issues such as migration and climate change. Can you tell us about that? Well, in, in relation to the, uh, to the, the code of practice or you know, best practice in relation to dealing with harassment um, within the European institutions. Obviously, that to some extent flowed from the whole Me Too movement, and uh, mm -hmm. which, which started in the United States, uh, pretty much. And then uh, there was a lot of activity and activism within uh, the European Parliament um, in in relation to to harassment and and so on. Um, particularly, a lot of young women uh, working in the institutions. Um, so uh, we decided to. Um, first of all get our own house in order and put our own uh, update our own uh, best practice guidelines and then we also contacted all of the institutions and agencies and asked them to share with us their um uh, their their codes and then we we took the best practice from that and, and put it forward so i thought it was an important piece of work uh, to do because as well you know within within the European institutions, I mean, there are huge cultural differences, cultural divergences, and what might be appropriate from one uh, mm -hmm. place might not be. Uh, so, you know, I mean, that's always a part of the work that 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 that, that you do. Um, on uh, uh, migration and climate change, well, what I was saying there was that um, obviously the new commission put its own marker down, in, in particularly in relation to climate change. And... Uh, um uh, that was a huge part but when madame von der Leyen was uh, uh, trying to become president of the commission uh, she obviously in order to get the support of a parliament particular groupings in parliament she put heavy emphasis on 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 on, on climate change so you know we will monitor that uh, very closely and and actually in relation to the Black Rock uh, investment mm -hmm. uh, age is, uh, issue. I mean that that's part of it. I mean that the claim is rightly or wrongly. I don't know yet. I haven't looked into this. Um, that allowing Black Rock to to do this 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 piece of work uh, undermines the whole uh, climate change uh, agenda of, of of the Commission. So uh, we'll see whether that's <coughs> accurate or not. Uh, on migration, yeah, still. Hugely. I mean, one one of the agencies we've done a lot of work with is is Frontex, which is the border, the external border protection agency, essentially. And in recent years, because of the the migration issue, it has seen its budget go up enormously, from you know less than ten billion, I think, to you know tens of billions or millions rather millions. And um, uh, also the it's it's the border guards the frontex border guards i think that the plan is to increase their number to 10000 uh, within within a number of years so you can imagine there are huge fundamental rights issues in relation to that um monitoring frontex uh, mm -hmm. but also <clears throat> monitoring the, the the member states and there are big issues just this morning i was reading i think in the eu observer stories of, um, of of migrants trying to enter uh, certain countries and being beaten back literally beaten back um, and um, you know th th there there is a huge issue there uh, obviously Frontex has to do the work obviously we want the borders protected for all sorts of reasons but you know the EU is committed to it as a charter of fundamental rights and it has to live up to that even in difficult times so that's something that we will be following as well
Okay, we look forward to hearing more about that. We've covered a lot of ground there and a lot of policy areas, and I suppose that reflects the scope of your office. So thank you very much, Emily, and I'm going to hand back now to Noel. Thanks, Martina. Thanks very much, Martina. Wow, thank you, Emily. I I, I, I think I have a pain in my hand for from taking down some <laughs> notes. <laughs> Such a wide ranging uh, discussion and conversation between yourself and, and Martina and your keynote address. Thank you so much. I loved the, to influence change, you need a coalition of forces. Do you mind if I plagiarize that? <laughs> Please, I'm sure, I'm sure I've done the same. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm glad, I, okay, I have your permission, right? Everyone yeah, has yeah. heard. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Listen, Martina and yourself covered such a range of questions and topics, actually, um, that it's fantastic to see our, our online audience, I'm sure, will be happy that, that, that most of them have been touched upon. But I have a couple maybe that I might pose to you, Emily, uh, just to get your, your insights and thoughts on. As you, as you mentioned, an increasingly important issue for all of the European institutions, and not least an organization like ourselves here in European Movement Ireland, is the process of communications with the public. And, and you previously commented on the idea of uh, the European Union being perceived as being somewhat distant and the, and the how crucial it is to be transparent and visible, as you've mentioned this morning. Um, one of our one of our audience members wants to know whether you would support the live transmission of European Council meetings, and would you see that as maximum transparency? Um, well, I, I talk about not so much maximum transparency as appropriate transparency. Uh, I mean, I think there there has to be room for everybody to have their 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 their, their water cooler chats and their you know little discussions that the deliberative process, as it's called. And uh, in every good uh, FOI Act, including the Irish one, allows for that deliberative space to happen. But um, under the treaties, the people, have, you know, lawmaking has to be done in public. So at a certain point, we have to see the discussions um, when, when, they're, when they're reaching a conclusion. But we actually don't see that. I mean, if, if you go on to the council, and if you look at, you know, any any discussion that ones that we can see at that at ministerial level, I mean, it's the, the amount of information, it's so heavily controlled uh, that what you actually get is, 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 is very little. And I mean, I, I remember uh, during the Finnish presidency, because we were doing a lot of work on this, I actually logged on to one of them one time and it was I mean the the poor chairperson I spent more time saying cameras on cameras off cameras on trying to say this bit is okay so oh, no this bit isn't I mean it was just you know uh and um so I I think I think I think appropriate transparency but I think I think what we have said is that during in the life cycle of a regulation I mean when when the commission proposes something, okay? And the first people to start um, working on it are our own civil servants from all of the member states and working groups divided across sectors and areas and so on. So they do a lot of technical work. Then it gets passed up to our perm reps, our ambassadors at EU level, and then to ministers and so on. Um, so what we're saying is that at, at particular, at particular uh, milestones, I think that's the word we use, uh, there should be transparency about what the positions that member states have taken, um, because it. it I, while I understand trying to get twenty-seven member states to agree on something without agro, I mean, you have to balance that need out, as I said earlier, with with the need to have a transparent and democratic, uh, you know, political system with with within the EU that, that gives it legitimacy. I mean, it's inconceivable. Well, I think it is that in our in our country we wouldn't know what position Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, the Greens, whoever, Minister this, Minister that, were taking on a particular thing. But if we don't know, I mean, even in relation to the fishing quotas and the pesticides, I don't know what. They, well, I presume we saw the records, but I don't know what the Irish position is or the French or Belgian position is in relation to that. So. Let's say you're an NGO and you're trying to um, influence a particular regulation, uh, and let's say you're an NGO in, in France where this NGO uh, came from in relation to pesticides, and you want to put pressure on your government in relation to getting this advice um, accepted and adopted, you can't do that if you don't really know what, what the story is. So that democratic piece, which allows the people to influence or to have their legitimate treaty, constitutional, whatever you want to call it, role, is eroded when you can't know that. So maximum transparency, no, not everything has to be out there because that 
works against the public interest as well because people will go into little corners and do everything but certainly appropriate transparency and certainly knowing the positions that our, our, our own people take is important. So I think the answer to that one would be appropriate transparency. So okay. if you're, <laughs> very good, very good. Okay. Next question. I'm going to read this out because it's uh, to make sure I have it correctly. Um, so one of our audience members wants to know that their question for Emily is whether there is a prioritization of complaints by European citizens versus exercising the own initiative right to start an inquiry by the ombudsman. Um, uh, no, uh, you know, the, the complaints are dealt with uh, as speedily as possible. And in fact, one of the things that, that I did was to um, make sure that our pro we completely overhauled our processes so that now our complaints are dealt with a, a lot faster. Uh, in addition, we, we brought in what we call a fast track procedure for access to documents complaints. Um, I think people might be thinking that because we, we do a lot of the strategic, or they think we do a lot of strategic initiatives, that somehow that, you know, takes resources from, from the others. No, we, we, we staffed up to enable us to do the strategic initiatives. And also, one of the reasons that we do that is that if you have a systemic complaint, if you have a complaint that keeps coming back again, 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 um, then you're wasting a lot of resources in dealing with the same issue. Whereas if you do a, a strategic investigation into a systemic issue, then you sort the problem with one investigation as opposed to 20. So for example, when we did uh, an investigation to transparency of the EU-US TTIP talks, the transatlantic trade and investment partnership talks that were ongoing uh, when, I, when I took office, uh, we were getting access to documents complaints uh, quite frequently, as was the Commission. Um, so when we did our piece and made recommendations in relation to greater transparency, proactive uh, uh, release of documents and so on, the complaint numbers just dropped because it was there. So therefore, you know, it's it's not that, we, you know, by doing the strategic complaints, we're ignoring the, the, you know, the individual complaints. We actually help individual complainants by getting rid of a problem in one investigation rather than having the same issue drag on for, for years. Okay, oh, fantastic. And another question has, uh, an excellent question has come in from Regina O'Connor from AXA. And Emily, she has just said that we are at a new chapter in the EU and attest to our EU foundations. UK is playing hardball on Brexit transitions and Brexit in general, COVID economic shock, MFF negotiations, recovery fund, climate change. <laughs> what are Emily's views on whether there is now an accepted impetus to work together as a stronger European Union unit from the institutions, the member states, uh, the government. So I think Regina has fairly nailed all the challenges and opportunities, I think, facing uh, the European Union. What are your thoughts on whether that impetus is there from all forces to join together to go back to your point about influencing change, needing a coalition of forces? Well, I think Regina, it's absolutely right. Um, I mean, whether the impulse, well, I think the impulse is certainly there. The extent to which it is widely spread is, is, is the question. And I suppose when we see what happens in the council tomorrow, that will be an indicator of how um, whether a coalition of forces has got together to to uh, uh, to influence change or not. I mean, certainly in in the if you just take the health area, uh, I mean that's screaming the obvious that the EU needs to have a bigger role, if only. To, to make sure that we have the proper equipment when uh, enough enough equipment and enough personnel. Um, and I think it's already moving in, in, in that area in, in terms of uh, acquiring um, uh, medical equipment, everything from masks, whatever, and, and having uh, enabling, you know, doctors to uh, move into uh, areas of, of, of emergency and so on. Um, so certainly there is now a big push on to to have I think, what are they calling it the the pub, public health sphere or something you know to to increase EU competence in relation to health. Whether that will spill over in into other areas uh, remains to be seen. But I think this pandemic has shown us literally our interconnectedness um, and and also how you know. We, because because of the, the geographical nature of Europe, you know, we're, we're not like New Zealand and can just stop everybody coming in and everything will be fine. Um, we can't do that. So therefore, we have to work, uh, I would think, a lot more collaboratively and collectively uh, in order to do that. But it'll be interesting. I mean, that's where politics comes in. And that, yeah. that very much depends on who's in power at any point as well, you know. Um, 
so uh, and 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 whether uh you know people of a particular stripe in relation to this impulse so there is a sufficient uh, number of them to, uh, to make that change but certainly it's an opportunity if people want to move ahead with the, with the further integrating uh, certain certain sectors in in, in the eu then, then this is their moment big time yeah, absolutely. That future of Europe discussion uh, continues and I think is just is is going to gain even more uh, importance and credence as, as we face both the challenges and the opportunities that that lie ahead. Um, I, I just uh, see see I uh, just in terms of the timing that we that we've sadly, very sadly come to the end of, of our of our time allotment. Um, I, I think they say best practice webinars uh, last in around an hour. So we're, we're, we're bang on, bang on the money on that one. Um, if it just falls to me to, to bring matters to a conclusion. And if I could, on behalf of, uh, of, of behalf of our, our online audience and delighted to see such a level of interest, um, give a virtual round of applause, please, to a fantastic webinar this morning with uh, particular thanks to our guest of honor, keynote speaker, European Ombudsman, Emily O'Reilly, and, and fantastic thanks as well to our moderator, Martina Fitzgerald, for her excellent questions that mitigated uh, the need for me to, to, to go through all the questions from the audience because they were already being uh, um, asked and answered. So thank you both very much for being with us here this morning. If I could thank uh, you, our audience, for your engagement and support. It's fantastic to see the level of interest that's there uh, for our webinars. I, I think we're at number six or seven uh, at the moment, and we have many more coming down the the, uh, the, the, the tracks, which you will see at the end of this uh, webinar. Um, and until we uh, see you again, either in the real world or more, more than likely in the virtual world, uh, please do uh, stay safe and well and uh, look forward uh, to seeing you at our next webinar uh, that is coming up on the 30th of June. We're delighted to be collaborating with the European Parliament and their uh, webinar on the Celtic Interconnector on investing to connect. That's taking place on Tuesday, the 30th of June. You've already heard Emily mention the German presidency. We're delighted to have the German ambassador to Ireland uh, uh, deliver uh, our, our, our traditional biannual uh, presidency event, and that's going to be taking place on July the 7th. And we have a, an ongoing stream of events, projects and activities uh, continuing on for, for, for the next while. So please do get involved, uh, get in touch with us. We'd love to hear your comments and feedbacks. Thank you all again. Stay safe and well. And thank you, Emily and Martina. Thank you.